We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hello, everyone. I would I'll welcome to IGF Katowice 2021. My name is Piotr Sobolewski, and I'm a senior financial sector analyst at Politica Insight, which is Poland's leading source of political analysis and business intelligence. Today, I have an opportunity to moderate a discussion panel uh, on digital currency or CBDC. The title of our panel discussion is Digital Currency Paving a Way for Digital Innovations. And host of this panel is Visa a Global Payment Organization. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to moderate uh, a discussion with this incredible uh, group of experts from all over the world. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, Catherine Gu, uh, Global CBDC Lead at Visa. Peter Ostby, Special Advisor in Financial Infrastructure Department for Norges Bank, and Marek Diet, CEO of Warsaw Stock Exchange. Our panel will be uh, divided into two parts. Uh, in the first part, uh, I'll be asking our guests uh, some questions. During the second part uh, of, our, of the discussion, the audience will have a chance to direct some questions to the panel. So you have some time to think about and submit your question during the panel. And after the first part of our discussion, we'll address some of these questions. If you do have a question, don't hesitate, uh, please, to send it via chat in, uh, in the Zoom platform at any time during the presentation. Katarzyna Cerbus uh, from Graylink will be our online moderator, and she will be gathering your questions. Before we begin, I would like uh, to give a little bit of background on CBDC. Uh, CBDC is an abbreviation uh, of central bank um, digital currency. CBDC is one of the most popular words in financial sector in 2021. CBDC is quite complicated technology. It differs from uh, cryptocurrency and stable coins in that it is issued by central banks and has official legal tender status. There are two types of CBDC, wholesale, which means transaction between central banks and banks holding reserves and funds in the at the central bank. And the second, part, second type uh, is retail or general purpose uh, ones. In that case, CBDC are used as a digital equivalent of cash and would be used by all customers group. E-currency can be based on accounts or tokens. Uh, in the first case, uh, this would mean creating account at a central bank uh, for all citizens using a given currency. An alternative uh, would be to use tokens, which are already used in blockchain banks cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of uh, possible uh, application for CBDC, but it is quite uh, experimental technology. So far, not used on a large scale in any big country. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to address my first question to Catherine Gu, uh, who, re who represents uh, Visa. Good afternoon, Catherine. Could you, could you please tell us why are we talking about CBDC at all? What has happened in recent uh, years to make this topic uh, of digital currency so popular? Is it about the threats, or, uh, threats uh, from cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum? Or is it about the desire to attract unbanked customers? Or maybe there are other reasons for, for this mind. 
Good afternoon, Piotr. Very, th very much. Thank you for having me here. And uh, thank you, IGF, as well, for hosting the event. Very excited to be here. I, I do agree with you a lot of the things you said at the introduction. Uh, CBDC, for sure, we have seen a clear, strong momentum as kind of one of the most important kind of long-term strategic conversations that's been kind of carried out by many central banks around the world. And I think um, a lot of us probably have read many different re research and reports published by many um, credible, you know, like international organizations. So uh, probably one of the most popular quoted figures is that at the beginning of um, 2021, we already have over 86% of all the central banks in the world actively looking at uh, central bank deal currencies. Um, and I think this is incredible, which is kind of looking at, you know, the pace in which digital payments is evolving. You know, it's not to say we never had anything digital because we already have a pretty robust and um, very interoperable system thus far, but there's a lot of things that can be done better. And I think with newer technologies, there's always a need to innovate. And I think we all know that, you know, the usage of blockchain, especially when it comes to cryptocurrencies, um, has already been about 11, 12 years by now. And with that evolution, we definitely have seen a clear sort of growth around cryptocurrencies, as well as uh, stable coins. I think just by looking at the blockchain technology in and of itself, there's a lot of appeal in terms of thinking about, you know, from a system resiliency and security aspect, what could a decentralized or distributed system can do to complement, you know, some of the existing system we have in place. But I think there's many other reasons involved in that. Certainly, I think you touched around the competition issue, you know, we have a lot of competition from the private sector in the sense, the growth of stable coins that might destabilize financial system potentially as a risk and therefore, you know, as a natural response from the central bank's perspective, I think it is very sensible for them to think about how should I be looking at my own country's monetary policy and what is that relationship of my country's CBDC in relation to the stable coin. You also see that you know many different central banks at different stages um, of development. So for example, we know that you know, so there's some really early experiment already being done, say in Ecuador, and there's live CBDC already in places, <coughs> excuse me, like the Bahamas um, and the Eastern Caribbean. And of course, in China, they're running this huge uh, live pilot right now with many different uses in place. So I think it definitely encourages uh, central banks around the world to be at least starting to explore this in you know, a research and exploration phase to understand you know what's the implications um and this is where i think things are evolving really fast because we're trying to i think we don't want to just fit technology on top of things when we don't need them so it's extremely important to really identify what are the key reasons and i agree you know through some of the conversations as Visa we've been having with central banks, um, certainly financial inclusion is a huge aspect when they're thinking about different ways. And it's not only exclusive to CBDCs, but you know, different ways, how can I bring more unbanked people to access financial um, infrastructures? And CBDC can be a way to do that. There's also countries in which they're looking at you know, the decline of cash. Um, and I think that's kind of quite relevant, especially for, for places like Sweden and Norway, and in which, you know, as a complement to the physical cash, the digital version of cash coming directly from the central bank is kind of the next evolution that they want to explore. So I guess the point is there's many different nuances and reasons that potentially, you know, uh, propel any given central bank to actively look into it. Thank you, Catherine. That was very interesting. Uh, let's take a look at motivating sector, uh, factors for adopting CBDC in Norway. Uh, Peder, this year, Norges Bank decided to start uh, technical tests of analysis and analysis of the consequences of introducing uh, CBDC. Of course, this is not the beginning of your adventure with uh, this technology, as Norges Bank's CBDC research has been going on uh, since 2016. I'm very curious uh, what conclusions uh, have you drawn from the research conducted so far? And to what persuaded you to undertake these technical tests? Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for having me here. I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is a long question that takes some time to, to answer. 
uh, as you mentioned, we started with our project uh, almost uh, five years or more than five years ago now, in fact. Uh, and we have been going through various stages of research. We started by looking at it very high level, at the consequences, the motivation and possible technologies. Then we went further into the motivation for uh, CBDC in Norway, because that might be different from country to country. And uh, there we landed, for us, we need CBDC uh, the reason to look at CBDC is for uh, contingency reasons that we have some backup to private solutions. Norway, uh, it's a very low cash usage in Norway, so uh, we are very reliant on the bank system. Uh, we also uh, uh, face uh, the problem that uh, private solutions might have a market power and uh, cash is less of a competitive constraint. Uh, so CBDC could promote competition and maybe uh, most important for us is the sort of precautionary principle. The, the principle, there are a lot of developments in the payments area right now. We have a, a internationalization of uh, infrastructure uh, in the traditional system. We have new sort of competitors, stable coins, cryptocurrencies, uh, and we have to look uh, whether CBDC is uh, important for uh, being able to uh, provide our services in the in the future to to secure that the Norwegian Corona has uh, is attractive and that our payment system is safe and secure and that we have some control and governance of the system. So the precautionary principle is also very important for us. So that was the main motivation. And from that, we derived some characteristics that the CBDC should have in Norway. And we validated uh, those characteristics against uh, technical solutions. We have looked at blockchain technologies and uh, other technologies, traditional technologies. Uh, and we have come to the point that uh, many new technologies are promising. Uh, but we still are not sure if they can satisfy those uh, characteristics we are we need from a CBDC. So we found that the most uh, sort of uh, useful testing approach for us was experimental testing, where we could, instead of testing uh, one specific technical solution for all the characteristics, we could test a variety of technologies to get better informed into whether they can satisfy the characteristics. So starting this autumn, we have started experimental testing. And our plan is to uh, do that for uh, until June 2023. Uh, then we will have uh, more information. And then we can make a recommendation whether we should proceed with the, uh, with the CBDC project and what uh, technology should be uh, used for more like full-scale testing. Uh, but the introduction of CBDC uh, also might require political support and it will require, require uh, legislative amendments. So it's not only up to the central bank. Uh, and to this point, we feel that we have a, have a pretty uh, enough time to look carefully into this. Uh, so we can look carefully at the different technologies and make uh, analysis. Uh, but of course, we must also be prepared to move faster if that is uh, necessary. Uh, and of course, this experimental testing will also give us, uh, make us better equipped to, to move <laughs> faster if that is necessary. Yeah, sure. Fantastic. Thank you for your uh, insight, Peter. Uh, in Poland, the roadmap to in implement uh, CBDC is not as clear or as proactive as uh, it has been in Norway. Uh, on one hand, Marek Titl, uh, the CEO of Warsaw Stock Exchange, has spoken about the, about the need to create a digital slot. On the other hand, the National Bank of Poland uh, has been mostly silent on the issue and is, step, is instead focused on uh, developing transitional cash transaction. 
uh, how can decision makers uh, be convinced not to ignore that uh, increasingly popular topic of digital currencies? Marek, do you see the potential to activate a wider group of stakeholders in Poland to start discussion on a future action plan around the adoption of digital currency? Okay. Thank you very much for, for, for question and thank you very much for having me here. Great event. Um, uh, well, uh, the, the financial markets or capital markets are the prime users of the digital currency as it was shown uh, by the Swiss example, Swiss International Exchange, uh, International Bank for uh, settle, uh, Settlements and National Bank of Switzerland uh, paved the way with the tests of uh, digital currency. So the digital currency uh, benefits for capital markets are so obvious and, uh, uh, and there are literally no uh, drawbacks here or there are not visible drawbacks here. So uh, I'm sure that the financial institution uh, or capital market institution will uh, keep on putting pressure to, for more usage of um, central bank digital um, uh, currency as this was the the cheapest and the most efficient way to, to finance the uh, capital market. Uh, uh, re referring to what uh, Catherine and uh, Peter uh, uh, said, um, uh, I, I, I would add or chip in that the digital currency, uh, central bank digital currency is kind of programmable currency. So it's uh, same, uh, has the same or very similar features to cash, what Peter uh, nicely described, but you can also use it in many other ways as you can somehow invert the commas program it and the test in the China, what Catherine was referring to, 140 million people test that and there are plenty of experiments like, for example, uh, uh, limited lifetime of the cash or uh, some other uh, programmable features. So on the one hand, capital markets for sure create a beneficiary of that and as we in Poland, have uh, by far the largest uh, uh, capital market in the region. The trading volumes on our venue are uh, twice as much as the second in the region of Austria. So basically, uh, we, uh, we need to be on the front, forefront of development. So hoping for, for uh, uh, introduction of, for the test and proof of concept of digital currency sooner than later. But I see it also benefits for wider society, for monetary policy, for uh, fiscal policy, economic policy, so plenty of usage, and there will be increasing uh, pressure for uh, from different sources to to experiment with uh, digital uh, currencies uh, issued by the central bank. Thank, thank you. We talked about Norway and Poland, uh, but work on CBDC. Uh, as Catherine said, uh, is going all over the world. Uh, Visa is a participant in many groups working on this solution. Uh, according to the IMF, 110 countries are currently working on CBDC. That represents more than half the independent countries in the world. Uh, Catherine, how serious are these efforts? Uh, do you believe that all these countries uh, see CBDC as a viable uh, option or are these simply token efforts uh, done more for the sake of appearance? Uh, how is Visa supporting the participants in this uh, discussion globally? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, in the next three to five years, I truly believe, you know, this is going to be a phase in which many different uh, world central banks are going to be actively researching and exploring things. Uh, just because I think CBDC is such a huge topic, you know, if it does get implemented, it really represents a new form fact of money that has never existed in this world before. So it's a very serious, I think, um, sort of decision to make. And as I think Peter mentioned before, you know, it is not only just a monetary policy, it is also a political decision to be made. So I think you know, I, I, we as part of Visa, we have been talking to uh, many different central banks around the world, and we definitely know that, you know, there is no one size fits all solution to say this is how any CBDC should look like. And at least what we can share is 
you know, the commonality amongst all these central banks is like, you have to understand what are your motivations, what are your key policy objectives in order for the technology to then support it and design it appropriately. Maybe for some central banks in the end, they will after say two or three years of experimentation conclude that this is not necessary or it might not complement to the existing infrastructure. That could be possible and therefore, but you know, the next two, three years of time to really do the active experimentation is worthwhile and is very critical for us to come to the final decision of whether or not it makes sense for any particular country in mind. And I think, you know, coming to the second part of your question in terms of, you know, what is Visa trying to do? And I think it goes back to our root sort of approach, which is we are a network of networks and we're trying to support payments so that is secure, fast, and seamlessly, you know, happening across different systems. In and of itself is quite challenging, especially as you're getting new forms of digital payments and new forms of digital rails around the world, such as real-time payments and other sort of international sort of exchanges and inter-switches and stuff like that. It's like trying to figure out how to then combine all of them together and so that money can seamlessly move from one place to another in close to real-time fashion at a very economic cost. All of these are like big questions to sort of um, figure out. And I think, you know, as we're also trying to, uh, I think, becoming more fluent in the space of digital currencies, we're starting to kind of look out for products and capabilities that should be relevant to support the future of central bank digital currencies, but also any other forms of money that might be used uh, down the road. Great. Uh, thank you for your comment. Now it's time to ask slightly provocative question uh, for, for Peder. Peder, do we really need CBDCs or uh, can private solutions uh, such as uh, stable coins like uh, Tether, USD coin, or expected uh, DM from Facebook uh, fulfill the same objectives? Why is a central bank uh, a better issuer than a private company? Yeah. Thank you, Vilta. That was uh, a very good question that is a uh, uh, little difficult to answer, but uh, I will try to make it clear. I think on uh, kind of on the face that the stable coin and CBDC might look similar in many senses. They are stable against the official currency. They can serve many of the same uh, uh, functionalities. Uh, but at the same time, it's also important differences. Uh, one kind of obvious difference is that uh, that the CBDC is a claim of the central bank, which a stablecoin is not. But I think you must look it even more fundamentally to kind of reveal the differences, because the central bank has a, a kind of public uh, mandate uh, set out in the uh, law, uh, which shapes how we think that CBDCs should be designed and how it should operate. So a central bank is not uh, uh, profit maximizing. We are supposed we are we are serving the public uh, according to the goals set, set out in the law. Uh, when it comes to private uh, currencies, they are kind of intrinsically uh, uh, profit maximizing or serving some other goals that might not uh, overlap with the goal of the central bank. And that will shape their designs and decisions. And then maybe to some extent you can use regulation uh, to achieve some of the same goals. Uh, for instance, you can assume that the stable coin, at least when it's issued by a private issuer, they will want to hold the network advantages, network benefits for themselves. And then you can use uh, competition regulation or other regulations to, uh, to, to enforce interoperability. While we can, uh, we will have a stronger incentives to have uh, interoperability in, in the design, for instance, uh, because we are interested in that the CBDC can be used with a variety of uh, payment solution. It can be Visa, it can be other wallets, and it can be others. But we don't want uh, a user to be locked into a specific private 
provider. So that's uh, just an example. Uh, so I think that you you must always uh, think the purpose and and have that in the background when you think why we will do it and we we will issue a, a CBDC for different reasons and uh, uh, a stable coin is issues although the functionalities might be overlapping and I would like to add that that uh, I think that uh, CBDC and private solutions such as stable coin can exist side by side. For instance, private sectors is better at innovation, and uh, they might be more uh, maybe uh, brave in testing new functionalities and uh, things like that. So they can also serve as a kind of test bed for what kind of uh, functionalities a CBDC should should have. So I think it's a uh, room for uh, both here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Marek, uh, you were recently uh, interviewed by the uh, Business Insider when you mentioned one of the advantages of CBDC may be stimulating consumption. Uh, for example, social benefits uh, could be paid in the form of digital zloty and could have a limited payment term. It sounded interesting, but also raised some concern. For example, in non-democratic uh, countries, there could be a fear that this money might disappear from a bank account at any given time. How can we uh, build trust in such a solution? And are there any control mechanisms to prevent it uh, from happening? So first learning is you have to be very careful what you say in the interviews. Um, the, the second uh, thing is uh, what also Katrin uh, mentioned that uh, there should be every, uh, we should not start with technology and how to program our currencies, but we have to start with the politics and what we want to achieve. And also what Peter was uh, referring to stable coins versus CBDC is also important. Uh, um, and also in his first intervention, Peter, you mentioned that uh, that um, this issue of um, uh, to what extent you want to privatize our monetary policy. Currently in most of the uh, market economies or in all market economies, the banks are responsible for creating money and the central banks are controlling the uh, price for the money, so interest rates, but the uh, supply of the money is not controlled directly. And we can well imagine that we have uh, also, we have a CBDC where there is a direct control uh, of the central bank of the money supply. So. There is uh, no question of uh, price so directly, but the question is, or the price is uh, managed by the demand for money, but not for the supply. Supply is perfectly controlled by the central bank. And the same uh, can uh, um, should be decided. Uh, the mandate for the central bank is one thing, and the mandate for the uh, Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Economics or Social Affairs, to what extent they can use uh, uh, CBDC uh, or programmable currencies. So one uh, thing is a uh, limited lifetime. The, the other uh, possible solutions that there's limited amount of uh, or type of goods we can buy if we get a social support. Um, so they can be more targeted social aid. They can, there is a huge question to what extent we want to have uh, control of the over or transparency, how people spend the digital currency and to what extent we can allow for uh, not testing who is the owner of the CBDC, but if the C CBDC is a genie or not, but we can have anonymous transactions, very big issue, privacy issue. Uh, the, the, the other thing uh, is uh, related to, uh, to, for example, uh, uh, regional policies. So for example, in Poland, there are huge disparities between some regions where are very rich or relatively rich and regions where are very poor. And we can think about a kind of a cashback for uh, purchasing at the given region. Recently, we have a, a state aid for the tourist industry in form of the voucher for the families. So they, they, they can get some refund of their vacations in Poland with digital currency, you can program the thing next day. So we can have great, uh, uh, great uh, choice of uh, uh, instruments for both monetary fiscal policy and, or, and economic policy as a whole. Uh, and, 
is always uh, with the uh, social institution with capital I is that uh, you build the trust to them if you, there is a simple democratic control and uh, the decision of uh, policymakers and politicians are in line with the will of the majority with, uh, with also um, acceptance and uh, acceptance to the voice of minority. So uh, basically it should be an open process, open democratic process, how we want to program our uh, currencies. And this is, I'm then an economist. So uh, I, I, I feel that some uh, economists, my colleagues are, um, are trying to, to, to persuade a, a given a setup of the currency, uh, digital currency issued by the central bank without uh, taking into account this democratic process. Uh, and I'm quite sure that politics uh, and policies come first and then economists and IT specialists can design, but something what was broadly accepted by the society. What I'm uh, missing uh, in, um, in this discussion about CBDC that there is no, no not public discourse and the, there is no discussion about the variety of things we can achieve with the, uh, with the CBDC. We have only zero one decision. Are you for? cash or for digital cash and nothing in between. And this is uh, most time consuming and most important part is uh, this uh, political uh, decision process as correctly stated by Katrin. Wow, there's, there's a lot of possible application for, for CBDC. Thank you, Marek, for that detailed uh, answer. That brings us to uh, the second part of our discussion, uh, where we will put some questions we have received from the audience uh, to our panel. We have received uh, some interesting uh, um, audience questions already, but if you have a question, I encourage you to send it through the platform now. Uh, so, Kasia, could you please read the uh, first question we have? Yes, of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, uh, we have the first two questions that uh, go together, so I would read uh, them both. Uh, would CBDCs pave a way for a global monetary system or a system of globally harmonized monetary exchange system, which would also provide for abnormal fluctuations between currencies? And would it also provide a minimal level of transparency on the quantum of what each stable currency is issuing? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, that's a great question and common, uh, common uh, question we get asked. I think it would be great to hear uh, from Katrin uh, uh, something about this. Uh, Katrin, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your opinion on this? Well, I I'm not a, a central bank policymaker, so it is a bit challenging to address it accurately, I guess. Um, but I think what it is helpful, at least, uh, from what we observe is as we're talking a lot around central bank digital currencies in different countries, but also through international organizations, we do see that there is a strong need for standardization. And I think that's a really good progress to think about it because we understand that in the future, CBDCs might be built uh, on very different technology and different um, probably uh, rails and designs. But you know, in order for CBDC to be able to interoperate um, between different uh, you know, domestic uh, networks, so to speak, you have to have some sort of harmonization around standards which is much needed for everyone, I think, which is uh, working in this space. I don't know if in the future we're going to have one single monetary policy, unlikely, just because, you know, different countries have, again, very different fiscal and monetary needs. And I think probably Mary Campetto could say better than I do. But, you know, we do want to have a better way of standardizing of, you know, different form factors of money so that they can, in the future, much easier to interoperate uh, with one another. Thank you, Katrin. Katrin uh, Peder, would you agree with that uh, that point of view, or do you have a different opinion than than Katrin? Yeah, uh, I think it was a very good approach by Katrin. I think that when you when you hear that a global monetary system, that that sounds very big, and we we have no uh, kind of uh, ambition with our CBDC project in a little country like Norway to, to reform the global monetary system, uh, not even the monetary system uh, in a big perspective. What we have had so far is more of a efficient payment system perspective for Norway. Uh, and of course, the, 
it would be a benefit if uh, if different CBDCs from different countries could work together in some way, uh, being interoperable in in some sense, so that they could also uh, contribute to a more efficient uh, uh, cross border uh, cross border transaction. Uh, but we must also have in mind that, that uh, CBDC in some sense might uh, enable uh, currency substitution in some countries uh, so that uh, if some jurisdictions uh, introduce CBDC it might affect uh, the monetary system in other countries uh, uh, and I think that that is some something that is important for central banks to have in mind and to cooperate so that uh, so that the uh, international aspects and the uh, uh, opportunities related to CBDC is utilized in the in the best possible way. Okay, thank you. Uh, I I can see we have uh, other questions. Kadia, Kasia, could you? Uh, yes. So we have another three questions also from the audience line. It is good to see. Um, okay, I okay, I have it. Um, despite the adoption of digital currencies, their popularity may remain low. Uh, people might still prefer to pay in cash or with the electronic payment methods available today, for example, cards and transfers. How can we popularize solutions such as digital currencies, and how can we make this solution acceptable, uh, accessible to everyday people? Taking into account the quite complex subject of CBDC, which often requires specialist knowledge. Marek, I, I would be interested to hear your your view on this. Uh, well, uh, I'm happy to share my views, uh, but uh, I will, in conjunction with the other question about the role of commercial and rural banks in the system, because I think those two questions go together, by the way. So what we observe, for example, in Africa, that there was a tremendous progress in the payment system because of the mobile payments, uh, because there was no banking infrastructure, no ATMs, no terminals for uh, acquiring cards. So even in many places in Africa, Visa card was not that useful, sorry to say, Katrin. Uh, so, but the mobile payment, because, because the, 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 the most efficient um, solution prevails. And what Peter also said, and it was a very important thing, that there is, um, there should be a competitive system from uh, to the private ones. So we can have private ones, we can have public ones, and the most efficient and cheapest one will prevail. And actually, digital currencies are very uh, cheap as they we get rid of many intermediation, both in international trade. If we can set up our bank accounts with different central banks and we are a company which is trading globally, then we can have a, a, a spread, almost spread less uh, a translation of currencies, what can be a great benefit for the uh, international trade. So I think it, the digital currency will start with capital markets. Then this, in the second st stage, it will be international trade, then other B2B segments. And then at the end, it will be uh, B2C. And I'm sure the convenience and the effectiveness of the cost versus benefits uh, would make it popular. And it can be especially good for rural areas or the areas with less developed infrastructure, because this uh, pay, if it's done right, this uh, it will democratize the payment. Even a small company operating in the southeast of Poland would be able to trade with the partner uh, in uh, Argentina using digital currency of Argentinian Central Bank and the Polish Central Bank with very low spreads and transaction costs uh, and uh, real-time uh, transfers. Katrina, what, what do you think? Yeah, thank you, Piotr. And I think this is a fantastic question. And I think, you know, this is where I really think from the visa perspective, as a payment service provider, we can add a lot of value to this uh, discussion, because I think what you would recognize is that with any sort of completely brand new technology being introduced um, to, to any economy, one of the biggest challenge that, uh, you know, people normally face is the, the fact about adoption. How can you drive early adoption of CBDC from day one? and really like let everyone to use it from you know right from the beginning without 
massive sort of disruption to the way that they want to have the experience about spending, as well as, you know, from the merchants and business side about the experience, how they want to accept the money. So it is actually a really important question. And I definitely want to sort of highlight, you know, amongst many of the conversation we have had with central banks, that's actually one of, despite all the sort of uniqueness about CBDC and motivations, this is actually one of the common, I guess, challenge that different central banks have expressed, which is, you know, how do I think about the user adoption? And I think from the visa uh, perspective, we are, you know, we've been building a network and a network of networks that we're familiar with how to drive those mass adoptions. So to give the concrete of how we're thinking about it in the space, uh, very recently, we actually participated in this uh, global CBDC challenge, which was uh, hosted by the Monetary Authority of Singapore alongside um, uh, several international organizations. And what we have sort of demonstrated is actually a very neat and straightforward sort of retail CBDC solution. And the key is to make it seamlessly integrated into the existing infrastructure so that we're trying to sort of envision how we can build a bridge when an on-ramp connecting this sort of new potential CBDC networks seamlessly at the back end into the existing infrastructure so that you can enable anyone simply having say uh, a visa debit card or visa prepaid card as it's linked to your cbdc account and spend with your C cbdc from day one you can go to your coffee shop tomorrow and use the new form of money that is cbdc to purchase a good and then from the merchant side they will still be able to accept as is using the existing point of sale terminal so i think you know if you're thinking about different phases of cbdc adoption like the first phase about this bootstrapping about how to drive that initial adoption is super crucial and it really needs to be designed well so that you know from the consumer's perspective it's a very familiar accessible and trusted experience that you know they want to enjoy and then you don't cause massive disruption to the business and merchant side now i think marik also mentioned a lot about these exciting programmable um, possibilities as well as things such as offline payment because you know, in rural areas, you might have limited internet connectivity and such. And I think again, that's that's the beauty of you know innovation. And what more can we bring to the world? What I mentioned just now is a simple retail solution. We're trying to bring our existing capability to support the new CBDC when they emerge in the market. Thinking about going forward down the road is really about if how could we support, say, for example, offline payment system? We have published research around it and we're actually building out um sort of technology around it and similarly you know a lot of the programmable features on top of what we have built for the retail solution it is all very possible and these are the things we do want to co-create you know directly with central banks as well as directly with uh, rural and commercial banks to kind of design those specific features do we have another questions? Uh, yes, actually, I received a message that there are some people located in the room in Katowice that would like to ask a question to our panelists. Um, so please, the floor is yours. If there is anyone located in Katowice who would like to ask the question via microphone there. No, my question was answered already. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we have another question uh, online. Uh, the um, more of a philosophical question. Uh, what do you think about the CBDCs being managed from centralized institutions? While the initial premise of digital currencies, stable coins, coins is that the whole system is decentralized. Okay, thank you. I, I think the guest from Norges Bank might have some opinion on that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, um, for, for, for getting that question. Uh, it's a good question. <clears throat> uh, central Bank, they are centralized institutions and we are uh, performing our mandate according to the laws set by the people uh, uh, in terms of uh, the parliament. So, in some sense, uh, uh, we are a democratic institution in other ways than uh, the centralized uh, cryptocurrencies are. Uh, 
I think it's uh, important to to kind of separate the the uh, some technological aspects of CBDC uh, with others. Like we can we can utilize some new functionalities like programmability and so on without necessarily being uh, uh, decentralized. So uh, it it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, because you have programmability, the system must also be uh, decentralized. You can you can have a uh, both combinations, uh, and as, so I think that the, the, ex, the existence of uh, uh, of uh, how to say uh, decentralized currencies uh, prevents us from um, from looking at the same technologies. And you must also ask about what mission we have. We have a mission as a, as a central bank as provided by law. Uh, and uh, we are centralized in the sense that, that we can be held accountable according to the uh, to the Central Bank Act by the parliament. Uh, so I think that while there might be centralized elements in decentralized cur currencies that might not be held accountable. So I, I think it, it's, it's difficult to go into this deep philosophical uh, question here, uh, but I think that uh, uh, a CBDC is not uh, any, in any kind of conflict with, uh, uh, with decentralization uh, in the sense that we we can also use the same technologies for uh, a, a CBDC. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question uh, still connected to uh, coordination mechanisms um, and transparency. So shouldn't CB, uh, CBDC have an accountable and transparent coordination mechanism uh, meaning globally coordinated as di distinct from centralized and coordinated not only by banks, but involving all concerned actors um, in a balanced manner. Okay, Catherine, could you, could, you, could you reply to this question, please? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question and certainly in principle coordination. And I think going back to the previous question being asked, you know, around harmonization, I think it's the same principle in which we do need levels of coordination. And I think this is the conversation that different between different central banks, you know, between themselves and through international organizations, that's exactly what they're trying to, to sort of understand and achieve. Uh, I think, you know, we need to look at coordination both in a domestic setting, but also coordination around the international different players. And I don't think we need to un sort of treat coordination uh, same as centralized probably, because I think as we're looking at CBDC, there's a lot of discussion around two tier models, for example, a hybrid version in which you're trying to encourage the private and the public uh, partnership to work in sync with one another that's kind of as part of your own domestic you know like uh, design for the cbdc how that might be done and then you're looking at those international private sector players how can then uh, connect and support different cbdc systems across the world but when we're looking at you know certain standardization concretely for example what does the data format should look like when you're uh, sending a, 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 a message around a transaction you know, that is something we do need standardization to be driven by existing international organizations that has been dealing with, you know, the, the current way uh, systems have been run, so. Okay, and we have uh, probably one, one other question, right, Kasia? Yeah, we have uh, the last question for now. Uh, could the panelists give examples of programmable features that would be useful in the early stages of CBDCs? Marek, could you could, could you ask? Sure, sure. Um, uh, very happy to do this. Uh, one thing about uh, if I may chip into this uh, democracy, this uh, decentralized versus centralized. I spent early days of my career as an IT guy, and we were uh, fighting against mainframes and fine uh, thin clients. 
uh, in, uh, and to changing the infrastructure to server client uh, structure. And now with the, um, with the cloud, we do the reverse. We have thin clients on our computers and we get of the uh, get rid of the server clients. So I think the centralization, centralization, there's always back and forth. So it's always changing. So there was a period of 10 years of decentralization of cryptocurrencies. Now we need centralization or centralization and the, the two of us will, will, will somehow co coexist and will uh, have a different role. So, but uh, coming back to the, uh, to the uh, question about programmable features, is, um, I've, 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 I'm a firm believer in, the, uh, in this capital market story. So I think we will have, uh, we can have, think about wallet where we uh, get our, uh, let's say salary, uh, in the digital form, it is um, uh, uh, the, this, uh, in real time um, put into different financial assets according to our portfolio needs. And we go for pizza and out of this portfolio we pay uh, for our pizza. So our balance sheet in pro rata in the portfolio of equity, stocks, cryptocurrencies, uh, commodities, whatever you might think of, is simply um, decreasing. So this could be the, the first uh, uh, the first application of digital currencies for uh, for let's say a rich world, um, and for um, a slightly less developed um, uh, um, countries, then they can be the the, the, the whole uh, ease of payment. Uh, and as Catherine correctly mentioned, we can have uh, digital currencies also used uh, on offline. Uh, when there are simply codes which we can be decoded uh, in our um, in our uh, in, in our devices, and we can even think about very simple, basic uh, phones, not smartphones, which can handle uh, the digital currencies. So, any electronic device can uh, can be our payment uh, um, yeah, payment uh, um, interface, uh, and um, this would be the first I can think. Uh, think of all the issues uh, I mentioned, the social policy and so on. It's rather uh, second stage for me. Okay, uh, the questions are behind us. Uh, finally, I would like uh, to ask each of our guests to indicate one or two recommendations for regulators, supervisors, central banks, or companies. We would like to know how in your opinion, uh, the work on CBDC should proceed in order to achieve the intended result. Is it possible to create one global standard for CBDC? And what applications uh, should, we, should, uh, should we focus on? Uh, maybe let's start with uh, Katri. Absolutely. Um, I think just echoing to what I said at the very beginning of this uh, panel, I do think that in the next few years is going to be critical as all of us are trying to explore this new uh, era, so to speak, uh, before CBDC really come to the world. And therefore, I think this uh, active dialogue is one of the most important things because, you know, we're all trying to learn something entirely new and need to understand what is the, the need from, say, central bank's perspective of how they think the private sector can best provide their value uh, to the system. And also, as we're building out, say, rapid prototyping and research, we would really like to get the feedbacks from both the central banks, but also from our banking partners and the fintech partners to understand, does our solution really address um, you know, what they're observing in the industry? And also, by the way, we, uh, we recently, I think this week, just published a user survey across the globe, understanding people's perception on crypto, on stable coins, on CBDC. And I think over time, these sort of user-centric approach need to be emphasized again and again so that we can understand what are the potential use cases, what are the personas in which CBDC is really trying to target. And I would just quickly highlight in terms of your saying, what are some of the key areas for CBDC? Certainly, I think this has been mentioned several times by Marek, um, around programmability such as offline payment is really, really interesting, especially if we're trying to design or think about um, CBDC to complement cash as that digital version of cash, especially for areas with limited internet connectivity to solve for the financial inclusion aspect. I think this offline um, area is extremely interesting. And then I think privacy should also be an extremely important uh, factor. And I do think a lot of the um, conversation we'd be having is around how could you build, say, privacy-preserving technology to deliver certain things 
uh, through the through the payment system, including for CBDC. So. Okay, thank you, Katrina. Uh, Peter, uh, could, could you be next? Yes, uh, I've lost your picture, but uh, I hope you see me. Uh, it's a little difficult to sort of uh, give advice to a central bank since I'm uh, from a central bank uh, myself. But uh, from my perspective, I, I think uh, it's important to be open minded and uh, to be sort of open to think uh, outside the box. Uh, talk uh, to people, talk to fintech companies, talk to other companies, because there are a lot of ideas around there. When it comes to design, I think it's important to be, be flexible, uh, to test out flexible design that, that doesn't lock in certain features into a CBDC uh, system, uh, because the trade-offs might change in the future. For instance, uh, the attitude towards privacy and payments, uh, the attitude towards um, new technologies might change in the future. And I think it's very important that uh, a CBDC is uh, uh, flexible and uh, adaptable to whatever the future brings. Okay, and uh, finally, Maradit. Um, uh, I noticed that the uh, number of uh, uh, viewers increased uh, from 17 to 29 in the peak and now it's 21, so it's time to finish. So I will have just four, uh, four advices. So first advice is experiment. The second is experiment. The third is experiment. And the fourth is disclose the uh, experiment results uh, to the public so that people are, are well informed and then uh, will uh, will have a um, better world with more democratic approach to um, uh, issuing and controlling money is, is supply via digital currency. Okay, thank you. thank you. At this point, at this point, we have to finish our panel discussion. Uh, we are, we have uh, four, four minutes left. Uh, I, I would like to thank our participants for for the many insightful observations and opinions. I would like to thank the audience uh, for their active participations in uh, in our uh, discussion. It was a great pleasure to host this panel. We hope that we have aroused your curiosity to deepen your knowledge in the field of CBDC, to implement this solution, uh, experiment with it, or consciously observe the progress of implementation of digital currency. Good luck and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.